Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. Welcome back to AstroFest. My name is Kevin Kanad. I'm the manager of the planetarium at the Newark Museum of Art. And this afternoon, we have a very exciting program for you. Uh, in just a moment, uh, we're going to be talking with uh, Dr. May Demison. Uh, and so uh, before we do that, I've got a couple of, uh, of notes here, some uh, uh, couple of things to mention here before we really get started. Uh, this is all part of our uh, community days of the series of programs we've been doing at the Newark Museum all year. And those are made possible with the generous support of our funders. Thank you to the Horizon Foundation for New Jersey and the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs for their support. For those of you who have not used uh, Zoom before, uh, please do notice the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And if you click on that button, you'll be able to enter your questions uh, for Dr. Jemison, uh, and we'll be taking care of those questions uh, at, towards the end of the program. Uh, but please do use that Q&A feature, okay? Uh, let me introduce you first uh, to two young people we have with us on our session today. Uh, they are part of the Museum's Explorer program. And this is a college career and life readiness pro program for high school students. And so, uh, Patrick, you want to introduce yourself first? Yeah, of course. Uh, my name is Bob Tony Patrick Ajayi. I'm currently a senior in the New York Museum of Art Explorer program. I'm very happy to be here today. Okay, Fanta. Fanta, are you, uh, you're muted at the moment, Fanta. Could you introduce yourself? Oh dear, well, we seem to have lost Fanta there. Well, we'll, we'll come back to her. Uh, let me introduce our, 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 our guest here. Uh, our very special guest today is Dr. May Carol Jamison. She is an engineer and uh, a physician and a former NASA astronaut. And uh, she was the first woman of color to travel into space. And after six years as a NASA astronaut, uh, she was the first, uh, she was uh, uh, founded, sorry, she founded a technology consulting uh, firm and a medical device company. Uh, she also founded the Earth We Share, a science literacy camp uh, for students. And as an environmental studies professor at Dartmouth College, uh, she worked on sustainable technology for the developing world. Over the years, she has run many awards, uh, too many of the list here, uh, as well as uh, a dozen honorary degrees. Uh, she currently leads the 100 year Starship Project, which is really uh, a bold initiative to explore the possibility of sending humans to other stars within the next 100 years. It's pretty exciting. And we are very happy to have her back with us. This is actually her second visit to Newark, this one, a uh, virtual one. Uh, I remember as a young planetary ast uh, planet planetarium astronomer, a couple of years out of college, I remember watching Dr. Jemison uh, give uh, presentations at the Newark Museum to Newark school students, and so that was really exciting. And so, uh, without further ado, uh, let's, oops, getting some background noise here. Uh, let's uh, turn turn it over to Dr. Jamison. Welcome, Dr. Jamison. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. It is really a pleasure to be here today. I am so excited because yes, this is my second time coming to the museum and also because everyone is sharing with me their time. And you see time is the one truly irreplaceable commodity we have at our disposal. I want everybody to do this with me. There are 86,400 seconds in each day. Do the math, right? How many seconds in a minute? How many minutes in an hour? How many hours in a day? 86,400 seconds in each day. And each one of those seconds is extremely precious because we can do with each of those seconds exactly as we please, but we can never get a single one of those seconds back. But it's what we decide to do with our time that gives it its unlimited potential. So I wanna thank you for sharing with me your time this Saturday. Um, I should tell you the first thing that I wanted to do is to just spend a little time with you sort of thinking through when I look at space exploration and where I um, come down with it and how I got here. So I'm gonna start off by just thinking through this with you. You know, a lot of times folks ask me, how did you get into the space program or how did, did you get into STEM and what are the things that you do now? And I always like to tell them that I really think it started 
quite a while ago when I was a little kid and I looked up. So I'm gonna ask you a question. When was the last time you looked up? That is, do you remember if you're a grown up now or if you're a child, do you remember looking up at the sky? When I did, I would imagine who was looking up at the same time, whether they saw the same stars that I saw, whether they saw the same clouds that I saw. I imagine that children a thousand years ago would have been looking up and wondering what was happening. The children around the world were looking up and wondering what happened. I wondered what people again saw and I wondered what was out there. So this idea of looking up is really important, but it's something that's shared with every society, every culture around the world. An African proverb says, no one shows a child the sky. And when you think about it, it's one of the things that holds us together as a society, as a, as a, as a planet, the sky above us, even though some of us may see different stars because we're in different hemispheres, or of course we're gonna see different weather, but the sky connects us. And that was a part of, that was a part of me. It's not something that I had to go toward. I grew up in the 1960s. So I wasn't quite old enough to be a hippie, sort of resented that, but I grew up during a time when it seemed like our potential was limitless. In the 60s, we were discovering new subatomic particles all the time. We were um, breaking all kinds of records. We were breaking the records uh, in terms of speed, whether it's track and field, whether it was airplanes, we were breaking uh, records all the time. There was a modern day civil rights movement. Everybody thought they had the right to participate. There's a women's movement. There was decolonialization around the world. There was creativity with the arts and the sciences. There was new music, new art, and everybody wanted to participate. And that world is what shaped me. That's the world that I grew up in where I could see that I could be involved in so many things. Um, and I assumed I would, even though at the time there were no women in the United States astronaut program and there were no people of color in the US astronaut program, I always assumed I'd go, I figured we'd figure this out by the time it was ready for me to go. So I had all these things I wanted to do. I wanted to be a dancer because I uh, loved Judith Jameson, uh, Lola Fulana, uh, Jerome Robbins, West Side Story. I wanted to be a physician. I wanted to be an astronomer, an artist. I took art classes everywhere. I wanted to be a biophysicist. I wanted to go into space. All of these things were part of who I wanted to be, what I intended to be. And so many times I think when we look at the world these days, people tell you to choose just one thing, right? But all of these things are possible. Let me tell you who I intended to be. And I'm going to ask you, who do you intend to be? But I intended to be involved with exploration. I wanted to be creative. I wanted to be challenged. That is, I didn't want something that was going to be the same every day that I always knew how to do. I wanted to be challenged. And I wanted to make a difference in this world. This is my list. I'd ask you to think about what your list is. Mine was exploring and curiosity finding out what was happening, creativity. Uh, creativity comes in the arts and the sciences, right? Because you have to think of new things. You have to figure out how to analyze them. I wanted to be challenged and I wanted to make a difference that I was here in this world, whether it was because of my connection with others or some uh, thing that I, I contributed. So this is what you know me for. So I had to show my space pictures, proof of pictures. So. Growing up as a little girl, I always assumed I would go into space. I can tell you I didn't necessarily want to be an astronaut because I thought by the time I grew up, I wouldn't necessarily have to be a crew member. I could just do my science in space, just like sometimes people go to other parts of the world and they go to other institutions to do their work and you don't have to be a crew on the ship. But I made it. So uh, these are my proof of pictures in front of the shuttle stack that we were going to fly on later with my crewmates. 
And this is actually my launch. It's STS-47 Space Lab J. And if you look really closely, you could see me on the midday. You know, maybe, maybe not. But that's the that's the vehicle that I flew on. And I had the opportunity to work with a crew. We took up a laboratory, a big laboratory in the back of the shuttle that carried, um, wow, we had over 44 different experiments. Some of them were on how the human body works well. And you can see in that picture, I have on this white garment and a white headband. And you can see Dr. Jan Davis, who is one of my crewmates. And she, we were on the same shift in the payload special. We were on the payload. And um, Jan has on the same garment. This garment was monitoring our, our autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is what regulates your breathing, your heart rate, your sweating, your blood pressure. And so we had this really cool equipment that was mobile worn. That was our job. And we wore it all the time, even when we were doing and working on some of the experiments that you saw. We looked at our heart. We looked at how semiconductor materials were made. Hmm, semiconductors. They're the kinds of things that are inside of your computers. They help to conduct electricity in different ways. And we thought we could make them better in space. So a lot of the experiments came from the Japanese Space Agency, and we all worked on those experiments. This is Dr. Uh, Jay Apt, who was the uh, sort of the operations crew member. He helped to take care of the shuttle itself while we were up in space. Remember I told you about, let me just go back for a second, exploration. Remember I told you that exploration comes in all forms? Well, sometimes when people think of exploration, they have it just in a certain way, but it's really about that curiosity and challenge it makes a difference. And it doesn't have to be just when you're in something like the space shuttle. The picture I'm showing you here is Kali Dung. It's a, a Cambodian refugee camp. And I worked there when I was a fourth year medical student. I went to medical school at uh, Cornell Medical College, which was on East 69th Street in Manhattan. So I was close by Newark at that time as well. But I worked there as a fourth year medical student helping to support healthcare. Um, it was a very tough environment, but these things affected me the rest of my life. Looking at some other things, after I left NASA, I wanted to be able to supply some of the same help that I had gotten. So I started, literally the first thing I started when I left NASA was the international science camp, The Earth We Share. And it was about making sure that students from around the world would get to learn each other, would get to understand what science is for. We had students from 12 to 16 years of age and they came from places like Sierra Leone, Portugal, uh, Spain, Derby, Kansas, <laughs> Los Angeles, Chicago, uh, India, lots of places, Ireland. And they would work together on problems like predict the hot public stocks in the year 2030. That doesn't sound so difficult now because back in 1994, it was very difficult. How many people can the earth hold? Lots of different projects. And if you see the name of the project was called the, the Earth We Share, rather the name of the program was called the Earth We Share because I recognized at that time that we all share this planet together. And that's one of the things that you learn from space that we share this planet together. And it's important for all students to get together and to learn about one another as well as solving problems. And it was all experiential. Those are things you make. But let's talk about what space has to do with you. Because I know lots of people want to go into space and it sounds like it's fun, right? But I want to ask everyone, what does space have to do with you? Hmm. I bet a lot of people have a smartphone. I bet some of you may even be using your smartphone now. And you know when you ask your smartphone to give you direction someplace, it has this global positioning satellite system on it, right? Satellites, it uses space exploration. So you have a space receiver in your hand. Weather satellites, we take them for granted, but we're able to monitor what's going on in the earth very easily. 
How many people have had a MRI, magnetic resonance imaging? It's based off of the same kinds of computer software that were developed to help scan data and assess data from planets that we might visit or send a probe to. And then just the social impact. We all see orbital sunrises. We think of space more and more. It's kind of interesting to me because these days, a lot of the issues that we're seeing really reflect somewhat similar to the 60s. Um, from space exploration, which is in the forefront, we have just people launching, to uh, social justice movements and us bringing, wanting to say, how does everyone contribute and be a part of this world? What I found from all of that is that space isn't just for rocket scientists and billionaires. In fact, that's our tagline from 100 Year Starship, which I'll talk about in a second. Space isn't just for rocket scientists and billionaires. Space is actually for all creative, daring innovators and explorers. Doesn't mean you have to go there. It means that whether it's a way to help us look at the world differently, or whether it's a mechanism, a way for us to use technologies to help improve life here on Earth, it's for everyone. It's not just for some people. Let me tell you about 100 Year Starship, which you heard about. 100 Year Starship is about making sure we have the capabilities for human travel beyond our solar system to another star in the next 100 years. Wow. I want to make sure I say this again, the capabilities, not a launch day. So we're not planning on launching the enterprise. We're just making sure we have the capabilities because so much of what's happened in our world right now has really had a lot of impetus from space exploration. So I led the organization that won a modest seed funding grant from DARPA. DARPA is a Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which is the premier research agency for uh, the US Defense Department. But our project is completely independent. It's completely um, just there to spawn and spark innovation. And what we believed is that this wasn't only about going to another star. This was really about how do we help our planet. And by pushing along things we don't know how to do, that makes a difference. Um, the name of our proposal that one, I think tells you what we believe. It was an inclusive, audacious journey transforms life here on Earth and beyond. And we invite everyone to be involved, from artists and scientists, for those who just love space, to the deep subject matter experts and those who've been in space or design rocket ships, and even think of things like warp drive. But I want to go back to a project that came directly from trying to get more people involved in what I think is one of the biggest potentials for space exploration goes back to that African proverb that says, no one shows a child the sky. It's the one thing, it's one of the things that glues all societies together around this planet. Every group of people on this planet have had folks who followed the heavens. <laughs> we had mythology. Our space exploration these days is built upon people thousands of generations before us who looked up in the sky. One of my ancestors, thousands of generations before me, looked up at the sky, said, you know, that speck of stardust right there was, or that speck of light was right there 10 years ago. Imagine the observational skills that required to be able to look at the heavens, to look at the stars and see that they were moving, to different differentiate some as planets, right? Because they moved more than others and to keep track of all these things, to keep track of when there was gonna be an eclipse and be able to predict it. We used the movement of the stars to, and the, the moon and the phases to predict when we should plant, right? To navigate, 
No one shows a child the sky. That brought us to creating an event that really built on that because all of our lives and well being are inextricably woven into the fabric of our planet Earth. And we're connected to the greater universe. And this isn't a choice, it's a reality. Sometimes as humans, as people, we think that we're not part of this planet, right? Or some kind of way we're outside of the greater universe. That's not true. We get our sustenance to grow from the sun, right? And our energy. So we really have to think about this. I wanted to make sure we formed a connection. And this project came about because I was talking with LaVar Burton, right? From uh, reading Rainbow, Star Trek, and uh, the, the star of the initial Roots series. And also Jill Tarter, who was a co-founder of the uh, SETI Institute. We were talking at South by Southwest a number of years ago we were introducing 100 Year Starship to the world. And we got to thinking that space exploration is one of those things that's really important for helping us connect with one another. And we came up with the project, Look Up. So again, I'm gonna ask you, when was the last time you looked up? Because it opens us up in very special ways. And Look Up was and uh, well, let's just say it like this. We created an app for it. It's called the Skyfi app, Sky Selfie. And it allows you to take images, photos, video, audio, create text around what you hope, dream, think, feel when you look up at the sky, what you think to offer. We premiered it um, or debuted it in October of 2018. We have people from all around the world looking up. We like to do other events now, but I invite you to download the Skyfi app. It's a, for free on Android and on the, uh, what's Google Play and on the uh, App Store. And the reason why we did it, because we believe that's what's above us unites us, that we can connect that way. And the important thing that I've learned from space is whether you're looking down at the earth, this beautiful planet that provides us with all we need, or whether we're looking up, that profound feeling is still there. The most important part of all of this is that we are all earthlings. Thank you. Great, fantastic. The uh, last time I looked up was uh, just last night. I went outside uh, in my front yard and was watching the International Space Station fly over. You know, so we were waving to the astronauts. <laughs> I don't know if you count, Kevin. <laughs> Isn't is that your job? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but no, you do count. <laughs> I have a biased opinion on the subject, you know. <laughs> but it um, strikes yeah. me that actually the term "look up." It means um, not only looking up physically, but it also has this meaning of things are going to get better and openness. And it strikes me again that that's connected with that whole feeling of, of being part of this greater universe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we in the uh, planetarium field, we have a little phrase we like to use, one world, one sky. And uh, so uh, we've uh, reached the, the point where uh, we would uh, like to start uh, uh, asking some questions from the audience. We've got a whole bunch of them uh, waiting in the, in the queue here. Uh, but uh, well, to kick it off, we're gonna have our explorers uh, ask a, a question of their own. And so I'd like to, Patrick, could you uh, come on and ask your question? Make sure you unmute yourself. Yeah, um, the first question that we have today comes from me. Um, as I read your geography, imagine that you were inclined towards dancing when young. What specific thing pushed you out of the realm of dancing and towards the realm of outer space? So nothing pushed me out. I still dance. <laughs> so the thing what I was hoping they would understand is that you can do a number of things. It's not a single thing. So it didn't push me out of the realm. When I went to medical school, I danced. Uh, I didn't, what, didn't get to be a professional dancer because you have to make that choice, right? But I took dance classes at Alvin Ailey. 
while I was in medical school in New York City, one of the things I did was I built a dance studio in my house when I first moved to Houston. And in uh, the second house I built, mainly because it's really important. You see, sometimes people think of creativity as just part of the arts. But again, it's part of the arts and the sciences and how you express yourself, right? You know, I think things like dance and uh, the arts help you express personal insight into the universe, your personal understanding of the universe. The sciences help you express or in influence the universe that's external to you. And so I think to me, they're both very important. So I never lost dance, bite your tongue. I went, when I went into space, I took up with me a poster of Judith Jameson performing the dance cry. Uh, Judith Jameson, an incredible dancer with the Alvin Ailey Dance Company who inspired me when I was a kid. And I took the poster up because I wanted to share it. So it never left me. Great, great. Thank you for that. So I, I'm going to ask Patrick sure. a question, though. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and my question of you, Patrick, is... Do you have just one thing that you like to do or do you have a number of things you like to do? Uh, that's a wonderful question. Um, at the ripe age of 17, I love doing a lot of things, whether it's science or humanitarian work. Uh, my two major interests would be um, biology and African-American history. Uh, I hope to expand on those courses when I go to college and just grow my interests when I grow older. So I'll add to that that I majored in chemical engineering and I also majored in African and African American studies in college. So you don't have to you don't have to pick one thing, but the important part is figuring out how to integrate them into what you do and to use your place and your knowledge and your experiences and skills. Great. Great. Uh, Fanta, you had a question of your own. You want to chime in? Um, Yes, I did. Um, to, to introduce myself, um, I'm Fanta Torre, and I'm a junior explorer from the museum. And I guess the first question that popped into my head was, how did you being labeled the first African American woman to travel into space, into space affect you mentally? Like, was there more pressure for you to do more in the community? Or just so the question about how does it affect me to be labeled the first African American woman. So let me go through this for a second. I would have gone into space if there had been thousands of people of every kind who had gone into space, because that's what I wanted to be. I would have gone into space if there had never been a single person of any kind who went into space. I'd have my hand up, I wanna go, I wanna go. <laughs> Another piece, um, I am fully aware that I am not the first woman of color or African-American woman to have the skill sets to have been in the astronaut program and to go into space. It happened to be a confluence of times, just like Sally Ride was not the first woman and we can go back to the 1960s where there was a conscious decision not to choose women to go into space. There was a, a, literally a conscious decision. And I could tell you some stories about that um, in terms of what happened when women were tested with the exact same tests that the male pilots, like the parts of the right stuff, the John Glenn's and the, you know, Alan Shepard's, Neil Armstrong, uh, not Neil, were tested. The women did better than the men in almost in all the tests as well or better. Men. But there was a conscious decision not to fly them. So I wasn't worried about my ability to perform. What I was surprised at when I was um, in Los Angeles and I got the call that uh, we want you to come aboard, I was surprised that I was really the first woman of color selected for the astronaut program. And I put that very, very uh, clearly. And, and then the being the first woman of color in the world to go into space, that was a different piece. And the reason why I say that is because many times when we think of these particular issues, we think of them as only about somebody who looks just like me and what it means, right? 
But I think that having those other images and those other people out there is just important as important for the gatekeepers. Those are the folks who say, oh, I'm going to admit you to this program, or I want you to be a colleague of mine, or who are giving out the contracts. So I thought it was as important for white males, who many times were the gatekeepers in STEM, as it was for young Black girls to see me. So did I feel any pressure? I suppose I could, but I wasn't worried about my ability to perform at all. What I'm more concerned with is, can I use my place at the table to help change things? How do I make sure that there are more people of all kinds? So remember I told you about the proposal for 100 Year Starship? I would bet that a lot of people would not expect someone who looks like me to be leading a project about interstellar space exploration. But the title of the proposal, the very first word, well, the second word was an inclusive audacious journey transforms life here on Earth and beyond. Inclusive across ethnicity, gender, and geography, but also inclusive across disciplines from the artists to the sciences, to biology, to the environment, to uh, human behavior and finance, because we need all of those perspectives to do important things in the world, right? We need all of those perspectives to do something that big. And we need those perspectives in order to survive as a species on this planet. That's a long winded answer because I had every right to be there. And no, I didn't feel pressured. I felt responsible. Thank you. Uh, let's see, um, we do wanna take some, uh, we do have many questions from the uh, audience. We do wanna start to take some uh, other questions here. Uh, Patrick, do you have another question for us? Yeah, uh, we have lots of shout outs and questions from young viewers. Right. Um, Rihanna says hello, Ruby says hello, Miley says hello. Um, everyone wants to know what does space look like? And of course, is it fun? Okay, I'm gonna do a shout out to my niece because I think she's on as well, Chari Jemison, who's in Cleveland. And I wanna say hello to everybody who said hello to me. Was space fun? I worked a lot, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so when you go up in the space, um, and especially back during the shuttle days, you only had so much time up there. And we did a laboratory mission and I was probably as heavily scheduled as anyone because I was the first time they flew a position called the science mission specialist, which always laughed and joked was like being Mr. Spock <laughs> on the start. So I was responsible for a lot of the science and to follow up into my task was always to take advantage of that microgravity environment and do as much as I could. But yes, that's fun too. That doesn't mean it's ha ha, I'm having a party, laughing fun. It means I'm fully engaged with the world and I'm, what I, I'm doing is important. Um, what is space like? I think it's different things for different people. Um, the view is pretty fantastic. Um, and when you look out, uh, you see this thin shimmering layer of light that's our atmosphere. And that's, that's what protects us, right? That's what we live in. So I felt very connected. Um, I felt very connected with the rest of the universe as well, because I even tried to imagine that I was at another star system 10,000 light years away and that felt okay. I tried to make myself afraid and I couldn't. There are physical feelings you get when you first get in a space and they eventually go away. You get to float. Like you're in a big pool of water, you just float, right? But you don't have to worry about breathing. Um, when you first get into space, also you have something called the fluid shift where some of the kids might not know this, but your parents, like all the fluid collects in your legs because you've been standing all day. Well, that all redistributes because there's no real down, right? When you're in microgravity, so the fluid reshifts and your head swells until you urinate all that fluid, the extra, what your body perceives as extra fluid, you get rid of it, and then you feel normal. Think about standing on your head for about 24 hours. That might be what it feels like. And then you're, everything is fine, but it's a silly feeling, but it's, it's really pretty wonderful. And yes, it's fun, but yes, you do a lot of work. 
very busy schedule for those uh, all the astronauts usually. Uh, okay, let's move on to another question. Uh, Fanta, do you have the next one? Um, um, what obstacles did you face and were you scared to space? What else? Because I faced, like I said, I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, I tried to make myself afraid, but I wasn't afraid because I was right where I wanted to be. And very rarely do you get an opportunity to be exactly where you wanted to be. That doesn't mean you don't have a good, healthy respect for what's going on and what's happening, but I wasn't afraid. Um, what obstacles did I face for what? <laughs> do you know? I guess in general, like, did you have like big feelings of sickness or did you show any of the experiments there? So I'm not really sure I heard everything, but in when we're in uh, space, you're really a lot of parts is getting the task done. So I said we had over 44 different experiments. We had experiments with frog embryology. We had to get everything on track. The biggest obstacle is probably time because you want to do so many things, especially back then. So that wasn't, uh, but that was something that I was very much trained for and it's something I really wanted to do. So um, I don't see any obstacles during the mission, right? So the, it's just, it's just really doing and executing your job. You spend so much time training, learning the experiments inside and out. For me, because I was a science mission specialist, I had a really strong wealth of knowledge about the science behind the experiments. So did the other payload crew. But, you know, so I could, if there were anything I could help do, I would help do it as well. So it was, uh, I didn't see any obstacles there, uh, particularly with space, except for space itself and you're in microgravity. So when people ask, is it fun? It's not a game because you're in a very serious situation where you have to pay attention, right? And you have to follow and execute really well, but not particular obstacles. And we didn't have anything go particularly wrong on our flight. Okay, okay. Uh, Patrick, do we have another question? Yeah, uh, what is one thing you look back at and are grateful for while you're in space? One thing? I mean, I was just, I was in space. <laughs> <laughs> I was in space. And I'm back here to share the story. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so many times people want to come up with one thing, this, that, uh, you know, I think it's really important to enjoy all of your experience in life. People will ask me, um, what are you most proud of? Well, it's probably not what you think, you know, what the person asked me, because I know everybody wants me to tell them I was going into space, but um, that's not something that I worried I could do. I'm probably most proud of things that other people could care less about, but I knew that inside of me, it required something extra for me to do. Like I was afraid of heights uh, growing up. And I write about that a little bit in my book and I'll tell you about a little bit more that's gonna come out as a second edition, but I was afraid of heights growing up as a kid. So that was something I had to overcome, right? And it's probably not, the only thing or the proudest thing, but it was certainly something, right? You know, proud things make you like being able to, uh, you know, improve how long you can run and how fast you can run and running up hills and things like that. So it's different at different times. I believe it's really important for us to embrace every moment that we have and not just look for uh, singular moments. There are some in life, there are some things that change us, but everything leading up to that moment and everything going away from that moment and the next new ones are important as well. So I don't spend a lot of time just looking back. I like to look forward and I like to be, live in the present as well. Great. Okay, uh, Fanta, do we have another question? Um, yes. 
the extension of space travel and SpaceX, would you ever go back to space? Say that again, I'm sorry. With the expansion of SpaceX and space travel, would you ever go back to space? I would have gone back to space beforehand. I mean, if ET lands in my backyard, you guys can look for me in Unsolved Mysteries or something like that. I mean, I'm gone if I could get a ride. Um, you know what? I, I, I'd go to Mars in a heartbeat. I'd go to the moon, yes. But it's really about the issue about what you have to do in order to be an astronaut, a NASA astronaut, it's a full-time job. And there were other contributions I thought I could make outside of NASA. One, for example, how do you promote space exploration? How do you connect it with people and around the world? How do I make sure other people get in and get involved? Um, how do I use my experience in sciences um, or sustainable development, all these issues? So yes, I would go back into space. If you guys give me a ticket, I'm out of here. <laughs> okay, uh, Patrick? Yeah, our next question has to do with how you experience space. What were the effects of your body while you were traveling? Okay, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna give you a fair warning. I want somebody to ask me something else besides space because you can go and find all this stuff out. You know, ask me some other stuff. How, uh, as I said, when you first go into space, um, the fluid, there's a fluid shift and it's called space adaptation syndrome. And you feel like you've been standing in your head for a couple of hours because you the fluid shifts from where it's sort of pooled in the bottom of your body. And at that point in time, your body, uh, there are uh, sensors in your carotid arteries and other places which sort of say you're fluid overloaded and then you urinate it out so that you're in what's a, a good, um, level of hydration for space, but it's dehydrated if you come back down to earth. So that's a change. You also have impact on your, on your heart and your cardiovascular system. Uh, it doesn't work as well. Imagine laying down for a bunch of days and then all of a sudden you get back up and your heart isn't working as well. That's part of because you have muscles and they decondition as well because you're not carrying around all this weight. You have to use your muscles. Bones, you reabsorb bone because your body's always losing bone. There are lots of things that happen to you. Uh, what they call, we work on things called countermeasures or prevention to try to stop them from happening. And a lot of it is because of, of weightlessness. Um, your body grew up in a weighted environment. And so all of a sudden you don't have that weight anymore and your body keeps absorbing and laying down bone and doing different things. But, um, you know, we're working on, on how, to, how to improve that, how to keep people healthy. Yeah. Okay, Patrick, we have another question from the audience. Yes, um, who are you inspired by? And uh, this kind of is related to space, kind of not. Um, what is your favorite planet to look at? How is that not related to space? Well, not like experience, yes. <laughs> but you got to be there. <laughs> I, I, you know, what's this with the favorite planets? People ask me that. I mean, the planets, you know, they're all good, right? <laughs> they're all good. I, you know, I must like Earth. I must like Earth a lot, right? Because that's, that's the only one that we know we can live on without uh, extraordinary measures. But, um, they're all, you know, Saturn's pretty cool. I've always liked Venus when I was a little girl because it's our sister planet. And then you saw pictures of Neptune, which are absolutely fascinating. And then we see Pluto, which is, you know, we, we do this, not a planet, but, you know, growing up it was. And the pictures from Pluto are absolutely fascinating when we've gotten these uh, new explorers, uh, new probes to go in. Um, and then what was the other inspiration comes from life itself. So I wrote in, so I'm going to ask you to put up a, that picture, Kevin. I think you'll have it. And I'm just going to put this up. It's called Find Where the Wind Goes. I'm, I'm releasing a, a second edition of an autobiography, or autobiographical moments that I wrote for No, 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 put that down. <laughs> put that down. I okay. sent some okay. slides. I uh, sent unfortunately, those slides. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the slides. Okay. Uh, I did um, not receive them. Well, 
Okay, so um, if anybody in the control room has them, and, and you can just flash them up at any time, but it's called Find Where the Wind Goes, and it's the second edition. And the reason why I wanted to put up the cover, because it was written from the perspective of teenagers, what I want my teenage self to know about things. And I, I deal with the issue of role models and inspiration and stuff. I think that all of us are born excited and inspired, right? Because if we weren't, we wouldn't learn to walk, to talk, to do all those things that are really pretty tough to do. When you think about it, you come out and you're this little thing. So you have to have a lot of inspiration. The big issue is how do you not lose it, right? Um, but I've learned from so many people. You learn from um, you know, your brothers, your sisters, your parents. I think the biggest, um, sort of role, the biggest role models in your life are always the people around you. And we have to remember that role models can be good or bad, right? You can learn to procrastinate. You can learn to go all out. You can learn to be kind. All of those things happen. Um, in terms of inspiration, when I look up, I'm inspired. All of those things are there. Okay, should we uh, move on to another audience question? Patrick? Um, this is completely unrelated to space. Um, what advice would you give your younger self? See, you got to, guys, uh, you got to show this. You got to show the, uh, the cover because this is about advice for younger self. In the control room, you guys got to show this picture because um, the advice that I would give my younger self is to pay attention from moments large and small because inside of each one of them is uh, knowledge and you'll gain. I think the other is to have a sense of humor. I mean, luckily I did have a good sense of humor, but sometimes people, you always want to take life seriously, but you won't, don't wanna take yourself over seriously because I can guarantee you're gonna do some silly stuff. Right. And if you sort of hang around with it, worrying about, wow, did I look bad? Am I embarrassed? Well, you might embarrass yourself, but you don't have to stay embarrassed for life. right? <laughs> you just have to figure out how not to do that again. Or what did you learn from it? Or maybe it really wasn't that embarrassing at all. Um, to, to pay attention and to... Uh, use your voice and use your power. So many times we give away our voice, right? There's this whole thing about being shy. So are we going to be so shy that you don't use your voice and if things are important? And the final thing is really to look for um, purpose, which is a word I used to keep in front of my desk at NASA. Why are you, what is your purpose in this given situation? You know, maybe in this particular situation, you can be quiet because it's not fulfilling a particular purpose, right? It, as long as you get done what you need to get done, but that's, a, that's really important. You know, when you think about school, your purpose in school is to learn, to explore, to grow, to come out of school with more experience, with more knowledge, with more confidence than you had before you went in. And the way you build confidence is not by sitting back. The way you build confidence is trying something, maybe failing, getting up, trying it again, and then succeeding. And you get to know what you're capable of. Okay, great. Um... Do we have another uh, audience question, Patrick? Yeah, of course. Um, we have many, many questions. Um, the next one has to do with just living life. Uh, do you have a mantra or a motto that helped you overcome or build resilience? To do what? To overcome or build resilience. Build what? I'm sorry. Resil resilience. resilience. Yes. Uh, that's what I was just talking about purpose. Yeah. You know, I, I, it's, you know, I, well, you get resilience by fall, failing and trying something again and realizing that, hey, uh, 
I made it. Or if I did this, I could be stronger, right? By testing and pushing your limits. And, and I'll tell you what, I'm gonna do one other resilience thing um, and say that um, we're trying to, we've sent the image and we're trying to send it again if somebody can do it. And the only reason why I want to do it is because it's really pretty. <laughs> and, <I> really yeah. want <laughs> yeah. it. and also to get people to pay attention because these questions are very much what I, I talk about. You know, resilience comes from things like I had, um, I'm the youngest. I was the youngest and still am the youngest of my siblings. And um, older siblings sometimes do stuff to younger siblings. And your resilience is built in where you still hang in there with them, even though they're bigger, stronger, and smarter than you are. That still comes in. Hey, there you go. But uh, <laughs> the reason why I wanted to put that up, it's um, this is a, the mantra. One thing I was consistent about was testing limits, mine and other people's, especially adults. And that was as a teenager in that it's not necessarily an easy path, right? But it's one thing, it's what you're meant to do as a teenager. What you're meant to do as a teenager. Now, don't let me get anybody in trouble because I'm not going to be there to back you up. But what you were meant to do is to find out how far you can go. And in fact, that's what we did with um, the earth we share. We had students work in teams to solve problems where there wasn't a single answer. And the teachers didn't have the answers, they were guides. And so we could go, you know, you wanna be able to use your own special powers, which you have as an adolescent, as a teenager, you have this incredible creativity and motivation. So try to find out where you can go. now. In terms of testing limits, that does not mean do foolish stuff, right? It means, you know, paying attention. There's some things you don't have to test because you've already seen it. It also means paying attention. If somebody else has done this and fallen off that cliff multiple times, unless you figured out a way to build a bridge, you know, don't try that same cliff dive, right? So those are, um, those are all the pieces, but my mantra really was around purpose and it really was around uh, testing limits and then getting back up and trying them again. When you test limits, you prepare as well. You think through things right, beforehand and then you think through them afterwards as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Oh, you can go to signalhillroad.com, Signal Hill Road. Com. It'll be out in uh, late December, so in time for New Year's oh. and stuff. Oh, great. Yeah. Don't you like the cover? It is very nice. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Feather earring and all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is one of my yes. signatures when I was growing up. Was oh, yeah. In, in college, <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, we're uh, almost out of time here, but I think we have time for a, a couple more questions, right? Uh, so uh, Patrick, uh, do we have another one that we can? Uh, can you talk okay. a little bit about climate change and how we might encourage everyone to take action? So I was an environmental studies professor for right. a number of years at Dartmouth. And that really came from um, the whole idea of putting together my experience with space and working in developing countries. And one of the things that we recognized early on, especially from space, was that the climate was changing and that humans were involved with that change. Why is this important? Um, again, we think frequently that we're outside of nature. We also think that, quote unquote, um, some new fangled technology is going to come that's going to allow us to continue our foolish behavior. But the one thing that I was confirmed for me when I was up in space was that the Earth will be here. When people say save the Earth, they're mistaken. But we do have to create treat it in such a way that it continues to support our life form. See, we got it wrong. 
the earth will be here. We don't have to be here. Species have come and gone on this planet. But we have to treat it in such a way. What does that mean? That means that we have to be familiar, we have to pay attention to how we consume resources. In the United States, we consume so much energy and we create so many pollutants. And then we have to think about, is that our fair share? We've done that for a number of years where people in developing, some of the developing countries of the world have very, very little to begin with. I live in a place where very frequently we over air condition during the summer in Texas. So you have to wear clothes, extra clothes right. inside to stay warm, right? From the right. air conditioning right. in the summer right. when, it's a, when it's 100 degrees outside. Yeah. And yet other places don't have enough energy to refrigerate vaccines and medications. This whole issue we're looking at right now with the pandemic it's not only from climate change, but it's from lack of sustainable behavior because we're encroaching, you know, more and more in every habitat. So become more and more in contact with animals and diseases that we wouldn't have been in contact before from Ebola, for example, to, um, you know, to some of the various different uh, viruses that we've seen we have to really rethink this. It means that we as humans have to understand that we have a certain level of resources and we have a certain amount of, of capacity and the earth only has a certain amount of capacity to absorb the carbon dioxide that we emit. It only has a certain capacity to continue to renew the soil. You know, one of the major issues that we face, we talk about climate change and we know climate change is here we um we've just seen things you know i grew up in chicago and for a long time we weren't getting snow when i really believed that you know this climate change was real because the models predicted erratic weather right that you get a lot of snow you get a lot of rain at one time but overall those were some of the things that were happening but a major issue that i concerned about when we think about the human's impact on the world is biodiversity. Not only the big organisms, right? So when we look at uh, mammals and we look at these big macro organisms, these are the lizards and stuff, we can, we can see that. But the soil, we're killing the soil as well. And we need special microbiome in the soil, different bacteria in the soil for plants to be able to fix nitrogen. Why? So plants grow. Why do we care? Because we can't fix sunlight, right? We can't do photosynthesis. You, you do biology, right, Patrick? Can we do photosynthesis? process. It's all from the earth. It's from the sun, the plant. And so we need that. And if we continue to destroy the biodiversity of our planet, we won't survive. I love space exploration, but Mars is not a plan B. Right. For generations to come, we're gonna be on this planet. This is gonna be our home. And so we have to figure out how to survive by understanding our resources, by being willing to share, to curtail, curtail some things, grow other things, understand that um, just because we had one kind of economic um, platform does not mean we have to keep those same economic products. Green products are just as good and really important. They're not something that's outside of us. The earth doesn't need us. We need the earth. And we are all earthlings. Absolutely. You're gonna have to. Uh, you're gonna have a place to come back to, <laughs> you know. Uh, and actually, we have a, we had a really. I saw a related question uh, from uh, Michael uh, uh, earlier. Uh, you talked about adjusting to space, but what was it like when you came back down? How long did it take you to adjust to ordinary life here on Earth when you came back down? 
for I, I wasn't up that long, so it's right. not like the folks in station who have to go right. through a whole rehabilitation. But it took it took a minute. It took a minute. So <laughs> think about when you're going, if you've ever been out on the beach and the water and the waves are bouncing you up and down, when you come back in on land, you got to get your earth like your land legs back or if you've been on a boat. So it has that kind of feeling. It took a couple of days uh, to really feel like grounded. Um, in space, I've been used to being able to push off and do things and, and operate differently than you. All of a sudden you can't push off, right? And you have to watch what you're, <laughs> what you're doing. You can't just put stuff there and it stays, it'll fall. So it took, a, it took a minute, but your body's physiology takes a little bit to get back. It depends yeah. on how long you've been up. Okay, okay. Uh, Patrick, do we have another question for in the audience? Yeah. Actually, um, Fanta has a question to ask. Sure, oh yeah. Fanta? Oh. You're muted, Fanta. There you go. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, some of our viewers, viewers wanted to know what was the Thanksgiving tradition. Oh, no, I, I need you to repeat that, Fanta. Yeah, we lost you there, Fanta. We lost you. Okay. Some of our viewers wanted to know what is your favorite Thanksgiving tradition? My favorite what? Thanksgiving tradition. What are my favorite? I don't, I didn't live the last part, but I heard favorites. So I'm just going to talk about my favorite cats. <laughs> well, the, I heard the word Thanksgiving, but you go, oh, go ahead. Favorite Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving tradition, I think is the word that we lost there. Yeah. Oh, my favorite Thanksgiving tradition, eating. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, so one of the, th I remember when I was a little kid, what I loved about Thanksgiving was helping my mother cook. And we'd also create these big fruit bowls, right? So there were fruit and nuts, there were tangerines and apples and pears. And we have these big fruit bowls and that's what we'd snack on. So I always loved fruit in this, this, the tradition of putting these together and creating um, this incredible meal. So I think the, the issue around Thanksgiving is always the camaraderie because the meal is sort of a, a, a means of getting everybody together. This year, we're not gonna all get together, but we can get together through calling each other over the, the internet and those kind of things and over, um, just over phone lines. I remember that I wasn't always home on Thanksgiving. So after I went to college, I remember spending Thanksgivings at school in my dorm. One year I went home, my first year I went back to my roommate who was from um, the San Joaquin Valley. I went back to her ranch with her and I learned how to ride horses and things like that. Other times I actually help other students. We put together things where we cook, but all the time I think it's really about gathering and paying attention to the world around us and to others and, and building that connection. Okay. Um, you were gonna, you were starting to mention about favorites. Uh, were you gonna talk about your cats? <laughs> Did I hear that yeah, right? I, I guess, you, know, you, you say favorite, <laughs> I say cats. <laughs> um, yeah, cats are pretty cool. They're um, especially domestic house cats. They come in all colors and shapes and they're all very confident and um, they, they can hang out with, you know, with the pack or they can be by themselves. They're good. They're curious. Little kids will go and explore things in the dark that I would be uh, worried about going from time to time. So it, to me, they're this, um, this just incredible amalgamation of great sensories, sense, sensing abilities, right? Um, athleticism, grace, and they can sleep. <laughs> <laughs> All the things we need to figure out how to do and they stand up for yep. themselves. Right. 
great. Okay. Uh, Patrick, we, we have another audience question. Yes. Um, some, of your, some of your viewers want to know, uh, what role do you think your parents had in helping you reach your goals? Everything. I, again, I'm going to do the role model and the images piece. People always these days point to folks who are in the public as role models. But the term role model actually came from, uh, it was a perfectly good psychological term from those who we learn our behavior from. Now, public figures, especially now, can influence our behavior. But we do learn most of our coping skills and our mechanisms from the people that we're around. Um, I chose my parents well. So, you know, the whole um, ability to, uh, my mother used to tell me to go look stuff up. She was a school teacher. My father um, did contract and he always held two jobs. He was a maintenance supervisor. So that ability to, to dig in deep and do your job and make sure it's finished, but also to always investigate things. They were the best scientists that I know because they would always say, pay attention, you know, what's critically, what's behind this, whether it's a political action or issue, or whether it's something that you're building in the house, or whether it's a conundrum you have, what's underneath it to pay attention to the background and to think through problems, to do research, uh, to find out. So they also, um, they, they didn't let me get away with foolishness, right? Um, but they would support me in lots of different projects and lots of different things. And, I, and, and all of those were important. So whereas they couldn't necessarily uh, guide me every step of the way and all of the things I did and all of my careers in terms of that was their subject matter, they could help me to understand how to move forward and had done that basic grounding that helped me to build confidence in myself so when I went out into the world, I felt as comfortable as anybody else. Great. Well, I think I think that's a good good note to end on here. Uh, we're just about out of time for our program. This has been a fascinating uh, session uh, talking to talking to Dr. Jemison, uh, but uh, we do do move, move on to our, some of our other programs. So we want to thank uh, Dr. Jemison for being with us today. We thank you very very much. Uh, it's been a wonderful uh, a second opportunity to, to talk to you here at the Newark Museum. And so thank you to everyone who has joined us today. And Kevin, we, uh, may I just yes? Oh. May I just yes. say one thing I want sure. to say yeah, thank ahead. I want to thank yeah. you for having me and I wanted to, to say the first thing that I what I remember from my first trip for the New York Museum is that you all presented me with this wonderful wire sculpture of an airplane that was made by some uh, students in uh, southern Africa I believe and it was a wire airplane of people who used to go around so the art and the science came together so I really appreciate you all having me here today. Thank you. Thank you. So just to remind everyone that uh, we are going to be moving on to the next part of our program at 2.30 p.m. We're going to be taking a tour of the USS Intrepid and the Space Shuttle Enterprise. Uh, and then at 4 p.m. we have the Chromatics. We have a really nice musical performance that's going to be taking place. So please visit our website, newarkmuseumart.org, uh, for registration details. And uh, if you're enjoying today's programs, please also make, uh, consider making a donation to the museum. Uh, we do have a uh, triple match uh, annual fund program going on right now. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for being with us.